There's a story that says in the mid-1950s, there was a governor who was on the campaign trail, chasing after votes, had woken up early in the morning, hadn't really had a big breakfast, was out campaigning, doing his thing, talking to people, and kind of worked right through lunch, and by mid-afternoon had ended up at a church barbecue. You can imagine perhaps some of the excitement as he saw some good church food. Was excited because at this point in the day, he was, he was famished. So he, he got in line, and as he's going through the line, there was a lady who was serving up the barbecue chicken, and she gave him a plate with a single piece on it, and he simply asked, Ma'am, would you mind if I had another piece? I'm really hungry. And she said, I'm sorry, sir, I'm only supposed to give one to every person. He says, well, I understand that, but could you make an exception? Like, I, haven't, I didn't have breakfast, I've been busy working all day, could I, could I just have a second piece? And she said, I'm, I'm sorry, sir, I'm, I'm only supposed to give one piece of chicken to everyone. From all accounts, the governor was a nice man, but perhaps today his, his hunger got the best of him. He says, ma'am, do you know who I am? I am the governor of this state. And she said, I'm sorry, mister, do you know who I am? I'm the lady that gives out the chicken. And you get one piece of chicken. Move on, mister. If it's, if it's not okay to question the lady who hands out the chicken at a chicken barbecue, is it okay for you and I to question God? I read this week that on average, studies have suggested that a four-year-old asks three to four hundred questions a day. I've gone through six four-year-olds. Another study, an author who did a study said that between the ages of two and five, children will ask 40,000 questions. What do you think the most common answer is to those questions that children ask from their parents? I'm going to have to suggest, if we're playing Family Feud, that one of the, 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 the answers that shows up on the board is, because I said so. And if it's okay for parents to ask all and answer all the, the simple, innocent questions that a, that a young child will ask with, because I said so, and the child is supposed to then bite their lip and just accept that answer, which often they do, What about the questions you and I have for our Heavenly Father? Are are you and I to take the same approach when it comes to those deep, heartfelt questions that we ask in our own hearts and minds to our Heavenly Father? As we ask those questions, should we just, does God expect us to simply just bite our lip and take whatever life gives us without any questions and just simply be happy with it? Or, is it okay for us to ask God questions? To ask why? To to ask and and seek understanding and and perhaps ask that question why when when we lose something valuable and that we treasure in our life, whether it be our, our job, our health, our property, or when we lose someone meaningful to us, a friend a spouse, a child. As we look at these verses, again from the book of Job, we see another example of Job just pouring out his emotions to God. And as we do, I want you to ask yourself, where do you think Job is as he's venting these emotions and asking these questions. Because we know where Job starts and where he ends, right? In faith. 
But in the middle, that faith is sorely tested and tried. In the middle, that faith goes through the ringer, doesn't it? And as he pours out these emotions that are on his heart and the discouragement and the, the lack of understanding that Job has, he asks God questions. In fact, there are some times where well, Job calls God his enemy. He accuses God of dealing arbitrarily with his life. He questions God. And so we have to ask the question, is, is it okay for Job to do what he did Or was Job not only speaking out of turn, had Job lost his faith? It's important for us because to ask those questions and to look at Job's words because Job is considered one of those great heroes of the Bible. Many Christians look to Job in their times of suffering because they see someone who struggled with all the things that go hand in hand with the trials and tribulations and hardships of life and came out with the faith. As I read these words, not only ask yourself where Job was and where he was while he was saying them, but if you think or ask yourself if you've ever found yourself thinking or feeling the exact same things Job did or something close to them. We read in chapter 3, Why did I not perish at birth and die as I came from the womb? Why were there knees to receive me and breasts that I might be nursed? Or why was I not hidden in the ground like a stillborn child, like an infant who never saw the light of day? Why is light given to those in misery and life to the bitter of soul, to those who long for death that does not come, who search for it more than hidden treasure, who are filled with gladness and rejoice when they reach the grave? Why is life given to a man whose way is hidden, whom God has hedged in? For sighing comes to me instead of food. My groans pour out like water. What I feared has come upon me. What I dreaded has happened to me. I have no peace, no quietness. I have no rest, but only turmoil. And then a bit later in chapter 7. Therefore, I will not keep silent. I will speak out in the anguish of my spirit. I will complain in the bitterness of my soul. You frighten me. You terrify me. So that I may prefer strangling and death rather than this body of mine. I despise my life. Leave me alone. My days have no meaning. You you certainly hear the, the pain and anguish of Job coming through, don't you? Those are statements God doesn't hear when things are going well in a person's life. God only hears those types of things when a person is going through some deep, some deep troubling pain. And it's not pain that can be minimized. I don't think you could go to Job and say, Job, it's no big deal what you've been going through because, well, it'll all work out. Nor would you minimize the pain of anybody is experiencing as they experience loss or hardship or trial. Those emotions are there and they're real. So is it okay for Job to ask the questions that he did, to make the statements that he did? Can he do those things and still have faith? I think to begin to answer the question, that question, we can start what I, with what I think is a, a common picture people have about what faith is. I think a a lot of people, a lot of Christians, would view faith as being the thing that enables me to to go through life and be able to handle things. Right? I can can picture myself, if I have a great faith, I, I can picture myself being able to handle the things that come up in life. Whether it be a a sickness, an illness, no matter what the day might throw at me, even if there are things that I cannot control, 
I want to be able to handle it without losing my mind. Someone explained it to me once like that and then used 1 Corinthians 10 as the basis for their reasoning and said, God isn't going to give me anything more than I can handle or that I should be able to handle. The problem is, is that was a lie. That's not what God says in 1 Corinthians 10. In 1 Corinthians 10, God is talking about how he won't let us be tempted beyond what we can bear. That as we are tempted, he says, there will be a way out for you. You can stand up under these temptations. You don't have to sin. In other words, God is saying as believers in Christ, we have the strength to stand up and and fight against temptation. Perhaps more strength than we often think we have. But he isn't saying that we now have the strength to stand up and bear any trial, any trouble, any distress, any hardship, any pain that may come into our life. That's not at all what God is saying. In fact, Paul in 2 Corinthians tells them about how God, all the things that God had sent into their life, or it, because of all the things they had sent into their life, says they were in a situation that was far beyond their ability to endure. Paul knew that the situation the Corinthians was in was beyond their ability to endure. And God knew it. God didn't expect them to handle it on their own. But if we want to accept for a moment that that premise is true, let's see where it takes us. Let's assume for a moment that you and I can handle everything or should be able to handle everything that comes up in life. If that's true... Why do you need God? Because you can handle it. If you can handle everything, what happens then the moment you're overwhelmed and you can't handle everything? Who fails? It's you. Because you should be able to handle everything. You see, as we experience those moments in life, those situations where suddenly not only may I not feel in control, but where I can't handle it, where there is that pain and emotional struggle going on in my life, where things are are in such a place that I don't feel like I can handle it, that I'm overwhelmed. When those times and situations in life occur, it's not because I have a lack of faith. In fact, the fact that there are things about your life that you can't handle doesn't mean you don't have faith. It just simply means that you are not God. And and the very fact that there are things about how God works and what he allows in your life, which might be beyond your understanding, doesn't mean that you don't have faith or a trust or confidence in God. It simply means you are are not God. I suppose we could could do it together, right? Repeat after me. I'm not God. I'm not God. I can't handle everything. I can't handle everything. And that's okay. I think you could look at our first lesson then is an example of what that might look like. 
Because in those moments where I recognize that not only am I not God, but I can't handle everything, it's now okay for me to pour out those heartfelt, deep questions that I have about what's going on in my life and how it all fits. And it's okay for me to ask those questions of God. And you can use Jacob as an example. Jacob was not one to shy away from asking God questions. It's, it's what made him a hero of faith. And in our Old Testament lesson, he's asking questions about God, about what's going to happen to his family. The next day he was meeting with Esau, who the last time he saw Esau, Esau was getting ready to kill him. You think there were a few questions going through Jacob's mind about what was going to happen the next day, about the safety of his family, his health, his property, his possessions? He was asking some pretty tough questions of God. He was hoping to get some understanding. And he wrestles with God all night. Why? I think it's the same reason why when a child has a broken bike, he goes, they go to their parent and ask them to fix it. And even if the parent doesn't fix it right away, what does the child continue to do? Go to the go to the parent, ask them to fix it, because they're confident that their parent has the ability to fix the bike. Jacob keeps going to God and wrestling with God because he is confident that God has the ability and the power to fix what's going on in Jacob's life. He does not continue to go to God in question because he's arrogant. Arrogance would be walking away and assuming that I can handle it on my own. Wrestling with God is evidence that we trust him, that we know that he is a good God even when things aren't good. So how did Jacob... And how did Job know that? I want you to pretend for a moment. Pretend you are one of Job's friends. You hear what's happened in Job's life. You come to Job, you you see the suffering, the agony, the the pain that Job is experiencing because of, of all the loss that he has gone through. What Bible passages would you use to comfort him? Job, God promises that he works out all things for the good of those who love him. Or, Job, do not worry. If God takes such good care of the grass of the fields and the birds of the air, how much more will he care for the crown of his creation? Or, Job, these trials have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold may be proved genuine. Job, remember, if if he did not spare his own son, how will he not also graciously give us all things? My guess is, as you thought about it, you may have had other passages that came to mind. Passages maybe that someone shared with you in a moment of your pain in order to comfort and encourage you? Did you know that all the passages you thought of, and the the three or four that I mentioned, all have one thing in common? They were not yet written when Job lived. All of the New Testament and 90 plus percent of the Old Testament hadn't been written yet. Job didn't know the comfort or didn't have the comfort that those passages describe. So where did Job find comfort? He found comfort in the one promise God had already given to him. A promise way back in the Garden of Eden where he promised Adam and Eve and all of Adam and Eve's followers that he was going to take care of everything. And so he promised that a son would come, a savior would come, who would forgive sin, would defeat the devil, would destroy death, would take care of everything that brings pain and suffering 
into this world. And Job clung to that one promise, just like Jacob did. For comparison's sake, Job clung to that one promise of God. Job had a single promise to hold on to. You and I today have almost 9,000, all of which have been perfectly kept by God. None of them have been broken. You and I can see the fulfillment of those promises. Right? We can cling to the same one promise that, that Job and Jacob did, and we can see how God sent his son into this world to forgive sin. A, a Savior who suffered pain and agony, who was abandoned by God, also that you and I could have the, the confidence that we never will, will be. We saw God keep his biggest promise that he has made to us. A promise to send a Savior who forgives us for all the times when we doubt God's promises, when we fail to trust the things that he's told us. A Savior who comes and assures us that he has something better for us. I remember not long after we moved down here to Birmingham, we went to a McDonald's and I'm for the life of me, I think it's, it's on Montclair Road, out as you get out towards I-20. This McDonald's, at least when we moved here, if I'm thinking of the right one, had an enormous playset out in front of it. Now, I would like to think that I'm a kid at heart. Like, I saw that and I'm like, I want to go in that. At the same time, being a responsible adult meant I at least had to pretend like I was going to be a decent parent. So I, I wouldn't say there was a joy in my heart when one of my daughters was seemingly at the highest point and was crying out because she was a little afraid, which meant that I had to go help her. But I quickly realized that from the last time I had been in a McDonald's playset, they had shrunk the size of the tubes. Like I was constantly hitting my head, finding it difficult to, to work around the different corners and, and curves that the tubes provided, all so that I could get up high enough to, to bring my daughter down safely. There was a reason why I hit my head and was constantly rubbing my shoulders on the sides of the tube. Because it turns out McDonald's doesn't make their play sets for six foot one children. It wasn't made for me. There's a reason why, as you and I go through life, we are going to be hitting our heads and experiencing all sorts of pain and suffering here in this world. Not only do you and I have to deal with sin and our own sinful nature, but as children of God, this, is what, this isn't what we were made for. It's what the writer to the Hebrews was describing in our second, in our second reading. That God has prepared a, a far better place for us a heavenly kingdom, a heavenly home where we'll live forever with him. You see, we weren't made for this place. God has something better planned for us. And the fact that you have questions not only about things here on earth, but questions about that place where we're going where there won't be any more tears or death or sorrow or pain or suffering, just further reinforces the point in our heads that we weren't made for this place. And we have a God who will take us there. A God who keeps his promises. A God who sent a Savior and forgives our sins. A God who's promised us a better place. So as you go through this life, ask those hard questions of God. 
Ask those deep, heartfelt questions that you have when you don't understand and when there's pain in your life. And understand, God may or may not give you understanding. He may or may not give you an answer to the pain that you're going through. But finally, our comfort doesn't come from having answers and understanding. The comfort and encouragement we have in life comes from a God and knowing that we have a God who loves us, who's good, a God who forgives our sins and promises us a, promises us a place that's far better. Amen. And the peace of God which goes beyond our understanding will guard and keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.